Welcome to Growth Marketer Academy with Ryan and Andrea Eldridge. Landing pages that convert are at the foundation of every business with a successful online presence. Yet landing pages remain largely misunderstood and poorly utilized. There are countless tips and tricks articles focused on creating a landing page that converts, but most of them just rehash the same strategies over and over again. In this episode, we'll reveal five uncommon landing page strategies that will take your page effectiveness to the next level. No cookie cutter landing page design tips today. If you want your landing pages to drive more conversions, stay tuned. This is Ryan Eldridge. And this is Andrea Eldridge. Welcome to Growth Marketer Academy. Bow chicka chicka this is episode 11 of the Growth Marketer Podcast. I'm Ryan Eldridge, Chief Strategist at Squirrel Digital Marketing. And this is Andrea Eldridge, Creative Director at Squirrel Digital Marketing. So we just wrapped our series on, I mean, it was 10 long, freaking long episodes. Uh, but about, amazing episodes. Oh, amazing, yes. Yeah. I listen to them as I go to sleep at night. But anyway, <laughs> there are 10 episodes about how to gain leads for your business without cold calling or knocking on doors. And it was a ton of fundamental info about how to use digital marketing for effective lead generation. If you're just getting started in this realm, make sure to go back and check those out. Yeah, excellent. So today, we're talking about good freaking stuff. Yeah, we get to start on some of our more focused materials. Yeah. So stuff that you can use to up your game, make your pages, content, emails, everything work better. Yeah. So today, we're going to start off with landing pages. And landing pages are pretty important for when it comes to your pay-per-click campaigns, your Facebook campaigns. Any uh, any major marketing efforts you're going to do, you're going to be building and use, utilizing landing pages. And so you can even use some of this in your SEO work. Mm -hmm. So let's get into some good stuff. Yeah, by this point, you probably know that you want to send site visitors to a specific focused landing page, not just your site's homepage. Yeah. And this is because you want to control that message. You want to limit the places where a visitor can get lost clicking around on your site. Um, you want to make everything on this one contained page lead that site visitor to your specific desired action. Yeah, because you know, the homepage has to be everything for everybody, right? So mm -hmm. if somebody's looking for widgets or if somebody's looking for information about your company or people are looking for you know, the services you provide or whatever, it has to kind of like give everybody everything, which means it doesn't give anybody exactly what they want. And, right. and it can be a confusing mess for some people if they're just, I just need to find out this one bit of information and and uh, I'm lost. So a landing page makes you hone in on that messaging a lot better. So you're going to be using a landing page to really hone in on a specific message and in a, a specific objective. So whether that's you want the visitor to give you their contact information, you want them to buy the product that you're highlighting, sign up for your webinar. Um, these are all very specific goals and objectives that you can use a landing page to really funnel that traffic to that specific point. Yeah. And you, you want to design your landing page. Uh, that will uh, say that again. The design of your landing page will really make or break your chance of converting that visitor into an actual like lead. Perfect. So let's get to our five uncommon tips to make your landing pages convert. So we're not talking about the stuff you've already seen. We're talking about some new cool stuff. Outside the box. Yes. Okay. All right. So pause for music. Boom, 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 boom. Okay. <laughs> Step number one, remove freeze points from your opt-in forms. People hate filling out forms. I know I do. So forms can cause your visitor to just kind of like freeze and it paralyzes them from taking action, oh. even whether or not they were planning on completing the form or not. It makes them go, wait a second. I Pers personal really story time. Personal story time. You're My favorite yours? time. Oh. So everyone gather around. So here is, uh, I was on a, a web page the other day and I, I, I needed to get some information and I already hunted on the web page for quite some time looking for what I wanted mm -hmm. and I just couldn't get it. And so I had to take that final leap into actually talking to somebody and I didn't want to like talk to them on the phone and they had a chat box. And I was like, oh, sweet. I'll just chat with whoever it is that's monitoring their stupid chat. And as soon as I pulled up their chat, I wanted to like instantly like, how do I do blah, blah, blah. Yeah. And it was a form that I had to like put in my username and password and all this other, or you know, I had to put in my your name. Your name and your email. Where and and I was like, I literally just, that's it, I, that was it. They you killed ended the process. I ended it and I, I left. I just forget it, I don't care now. Because that opt-in go was else. too much for where you were in your yeah. cycle. And I you just were like, wanted I just to answer, wanna I, can you do this one thing? And I'm not gonna give you my email address to answer whether or not you could just do that one 
darn thing. I was, yeah. I, I was, I'm still angry about it. I want to <laughs> write them a letter. Damn it. But I mean, so and yes, if you're presenting your customer or your visitor in this case with an opt-in as soon as they get to your page, it's going to really stop them and probably have them potentially just go back to wherever they came yeah. from because they're like, eh, it's not really worth so having to if give you've, you my if you've information. Got, if you've got some marketing thing that you're trying to give them or a report or a case study or something like that, something of that's it's kind of low value, right? I mean, seriously, if, if, it's a, if it's a case study, that's low value. They're not going to be able to take that and go sell it off, right? So there's no real value to the client other than they're trying to make a decision about your company. And if you hide that behind this big old form, how many employees do you have? Well, what was your last year's tax returns? And <laughs> who did you vote for in the 2016 election? And, and were you influenced by Russia? If it, it's all this stuff, you're, you're going to lose them. And all you want them to do is get your case study to show that your product or service is awesome, right? So freaking ditch the form. It's just ridiculous. Anyway. So it sounds as though what Ryan's really saying here, to paraphrase, <laughs> is that only use an opt-in form when there's something of value that yes. you're giving to them. Uh, but this tip is actually really how to optimize that opt-in form when you do need to have one yeah, on your page. Rain me back in. I yes, get you. Okay. Yeah. So let's refocus from don't have them at all to when you need them. Rant off. Go. Yes. You need to have um, some... <sighs> I get it. When you when you when you have to give them a form, but you don't want to make that form pre stop them from taking the action you want. And, and keep so, in mind that if you put them in a place that it's not necessary, it's yeah. going to create a point of friction, which you want to avoid as often as possible. So there is one tip that you can utilize to reduce the likelihood that it'll stop that visitor in their tracks, which is use a two step opt-in form. So that means it basically requires the visitor to click a call to action before they even see the form. Yes. So they don't see the form as soon as they land on your landing page because that's really the part that subconsciously causes them yeah. to go, oh, I don't really want to do this. I know I've had that reaction with landing pages that I've seen that are very brief and minimal and only have a form on them. Yeah. And I end up going, oh, I, I don't really want to have to supply you, my you information. You have to and be I, instantly leave without really scrolling yeah. further down to see what the page itself is offering. For a squeeze page like that to work, you have to be hitting real bottom of the funnel, right? You have They're to be ready hitting, to make that buying decision. Yeah, and, and it makes sense for landing pages. Like if you're Weight Watchers, for example, and you're like, lose 10 pounds in 10 days, which is unhealthy by the way <laughs> yeah but but if that's your if they that's your big pitch happen, yeah. and they're they click on an ad and you're like hey get a consultation right now so you can blah 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 that makes sense that's real bottom of the funnel but if yeah. you're saying here click here for my five tips on how to live a healthy lifestyle and then you're like what oh. you instantly go there and get asked to provide an email yeah. address to get it and, um, and it's a lot to ask for right up front so if you have a little download button it says oh you know get your free meal plan click here and they click here and then it goes oh well i need to someplace to send it so give me your name and address and and i'll send it to you that makes perfect sense and somebody will commit to that rather than oh i gotta sit here and fill out three fields that's gonna take like seven seconds i don't have that kind of time <laughs> So uh, visitors, honestly, prior to clicking on whatever is going to cause this form to either populate on the screen or take them to another page that has the form, don't even realize they're going to need to fill out a form and yeah. um, probably don't have to if they don't choose to get the lead magnet that you're offering. And so it causes them to be less um, quick in their decision to leave your page. Yeah. Um, and people are honestly more likely to complete an action once they've already clicked the button because they're subconsciously committed to the process, even yeah. just by clicking download now. It, they're like so close to done that it just seems like, oh, just this one more thing yeah. versus from the get go, seeing the form and going, oh, no, I don't want to do that. And I know we're going to talk about it at the end, but if you're hesitant at all and you're thinking, well, I'm already got a form and it's already converting at 20 percent. I'm feeling pretty good about it. Do I really want to like change? You can, depending on the software you're using. I mean, if you're doing it in WordPress or, you're, or coding it by hand, this takes a little bit more work. But if you're using like lead pages or, or click funnels or something like that, uh, you can just create an A-B test very quickly. Mm -hmm. change out the form, throw a, a button with a couple of benefit statements, and then see play the two against each other. Put 50% tra traffic to each form or each page and see which one works better. A-B testing will solve this problem for you. So you don't have to take our word for it. You can do it for your own business and see which one works. We'll get into A-B testing later on in the, in the show, but I just wanted to throw that out there in case yeah. people are like, I don't want to commit to that. You guys are crazy. I want to change something that's already working. <laughs> I love it how we like make little voices, you know. I, all we, we all of our do it with all due respect, all of all of the viewers, they're they're all like from Southern Alabama. I don't know if I want to do that. <laughs> <laughs> no offense if you're from Southern Alabama, but that's how you sound to us in California. Anyway, no. 
no, no, and no. <laughs> okay. Right. The other thing that you can do um, is auto fill form fields. This yeah. works great if you've got a customer that has already interacted with your site that you already know who they are. Um, you can auto fill the forms with their information. So all they have to do at this point is like click a button or maybe add one additional piece. It makes it seem so much more achievable oh, yeah. to them when they don't have to start from this you know beginning and have to give you a bunch of information they feel like you should already know and then they're like i've been your customer for like five yeah. years why do you have to you know ask me for my name and phone number again what this would require is is some marketing automation software if you want an example of how well this works you can go to hubspot and and just sign up for one of their things one of the download some marketing reporter or or a template or something and once you sign up for it, it goes into their CRM, and the next time you go back to HubSpot, it'll pre-fill out the form. And then all you do is click a button. Every time you want to opt into some other new thing, you just mm -hmm. click a button. It's so freaking easy, and it's it's just it's just good. It makes good sense, right? If I don't want to put in my information all the time, and it just works. Yeah. So if you want an example of it, go to HubSpot, check it out. You'll you'll be amazed. Now, if you've got a first-time visitor, you probably don't have much information about them. So what you can do is a little visual trick in this, uh, in this category. I love tricks. Yeah, a little magic. You can basically move the field label, which is the specific information that you're asking for, like first name, last name, email, inside the actual field mm -hmm. that the visitor is going to be entering their information into. Um, it creates the illusion that the stuff's mostly filled out already, and it just kind of creates this little mental visual trick. It seems easier to create a form that appears to be partially filled out already, even though it isn't. And so we'll have an example of this uh, in, the uh, show notes. in the show notes so you'll be able to see it. And the example we show is from a company called Webdab, Webdam. Um, but one of the interesting things about their form, the first thing I noticed is they're asking for a ton of information on this form. They want my first name, my last name, my company, my work email, my phone number, just to download a guide. Yeah. I mean, come on, you guys. You know that that's sales information that they're trying to gather from me, and I'm going to be now hesitant to convert on that form because it's yes. asking for so much. But if it just said, maybe give me your first and last name in a single field, Mm -hmm. And then my email address, I'm more likely to convert. You should consider each time you ask for more information, each field is going to lower your conversion percentage by 30%. That's on average. So I don't know where I came up with that statistic. I read it somewhere, but you have to look it up. Anyway. So limit the information that you ask for yeah. to just the stuff you absolutely need to do your next marketing step. Not everything you ideally, in the best case scenario, wish you could know about this customer. Yeah. Step number two is make it personal. So personalized landing pages do a number of benefits. They engage with your visitors. They make it seem like the offer is tailored just to them and their specific needs or concerns. Um, you don't need to know a visitor's entire personal history to personalize their experience. You can customize your landing pages for specific factors. Yeah. So one of those would be source of traffic, where they came from. Yeah. So if they're coming from Instagram or they're coming from uh, Pinterest or something like that, you can you can literally like m mirror the, the the user's experience where they're coming from. Mm -hmm. uh, we so have an a example there would be like for Pinterest, you'd have yeah. where the landing page goes be very image heavy, very. Um, oriented towards the same sort of look and feel of a Pinterest saved post. Yeah. If you make your landing page look like that, then it's going to feel very organic when they come over. In, in an upcoming episode, we're going to talk about marketing tips for Instagram. And in one of those tips is to almost mirror Instagram's experience, but to add the utilizations that you want. So for example, if somebody's looking at, you know, let's say you're a, a, a fitness guru and you're selling some sort of like fitness shake, because that's what they sell, right? <laughs> um, uh, and you want them to buy it, you can't put a link to that purchase in Instagram. You just can't. The only thing you can have is a little link in your bio. So if they click the link in your bio, you instead send them to a page that looks just like your Instagram account, like just like it. And then when they click the picture of you drinking the shake and they're like, oh, I totally want to buy that shake. You put a little buy button right there and they can just buy it right there. Yeah. It gives them the same experience, the same feeling from the platform they're coming from. It's very personalized and they don't have to like go, oh, do I have to learn where to go? to buy this stupid shake. I don't even know. I'm from Instagram. I don't know. I'm just going to go someplace I'm, else. Yeah, I'm just going to go someplace else. <laughs> um, so, and you're basically communicating in a format that's obviously better resonating for them. If they came over from Pinterest, that means that they use Pinterest and that's a format that they're comfortable with. Yeah. Another tool you can use to personalize your landing pages is dynamic text replacement. Uh, you'll sometimes see this referred to as DTR. Yeah. 
and this works just- this works great so uh if you're on adwords for an example and let's say you've got uh, five different keywords in a single group that all r- serve basically the same landing page but they're slightly different so to give you an example let's say you're selling uh, audio equipment, right? And, you're, and so you, you might have a receiver in there, you might have the cables for an audio equipment, you might have different brands in there, and you want to send them all to a general same landing page because you, you don't have the resources to create 20 landing pages for one ad group, right? So instead, every time somebody uses the keywords like um, audio video equipment for church, for example, then you can send them and, and essentially have the landing page change that will change the headline of the landing page to audio video equipment for churches. Or you can, let's say they're looking for um, specific cables for outside uh, audio equipment. You can then, again, when they, when they come up from that, that, that ad, the landing page will change dynamically to say something like outside video cables are the, or outside audio cables are the best. Click here to read all about whatever. Yeah. So it increases the relevancy of your page and it allows, again, a more consistent user experience for what exactly it is that they're searching for. In the show notes, we've included an example from Hootsuite again. Mm -hmm. I don't know if we mentioned Hootsuite before. No, we were talking about HubSpot earlier and we talked about WebDAM. Gotcha. Okay, so Hootsuite utilizes this tool, um, and we create and we included an image from one of these options where basically, if you search Google for social media scheduling tools, their page says schedule posts to save time on social media. If you search social media management tools, then the page says best way to manage social media. So they're basically changing the title text. Uh, the headline and the subheadline on the same landing page to mirror what the user typed into their Google search. Um, You can utilize the same function off a number of different platforms. It's not purely AdWords specific. And that will allow you to really customize that user experience. And again, marketing automation tools makes this dead simple. So from from HubSpot, uh, whatever marketing automation tool you're going to use, this is something you you can add in so it'll automatically change the web page. So you don't have to do this every time and create 100 landing pages. So another way to personalize your landing page is to the physical location of your visitor. Um, Basically, you're geo-targeting your landing page, and it lets you provide locally relevant offers, um, and it lets you, in certain cases, highlight the feel and culture of the local area, just to kind of feel as though you're more relevant to that specific searcher. Yeah, like, for an example, we we have a store in Portland, right? And there's sort of a theme in Portland, which is called Keep Portland Weird. And it's sort of everywhere, right? Mm-hmm. You see it written on the sides of buildings. There's posts. There's Instagram pages. And so it, it makes sense to talk about Key Portland weird on that landing page or to give them a visual of maybe some dude riding a unicycle with a clown hat on blowing, you know, bubbles. fire or something like that, right? <laughs> I mean, it, it kind of shows. you go to fire, I go to bubbles. But yeah. that's cool. Bubbles, whatever. Yeah. <laughs> So um, well, another company besides us that does this is Hertz, for example. They have different landing pages based on where their traffic's coming from because they service a number of different markets. They utilize it in their international marketing. So if you go and go to look for Hertz Singapore, you're going to see a landing page that's like four friends taking a selfie. Uh, and it calls out a deal for driving from Singapore to Malaysia. Whereas if you go and look for Hertz in Chile, it's going to show you a landing page with a pair of flip-flops and a coconut. So they have obviously targeted landing pages specific to geolocations. Yeah, that makes perfect sense. It can apply to local cities as well. So, you know, as you mentioned, as we do in in Portland, you can also do a different landing page for visitors from larger groups of areas. So say Florida versus Atlanta versus New York. Yeah. Um, connect with the area's demographic and culture and just basically increase the Cause relevance. Because you, you're going to have a different messaging to somebody who's in, in, in um, St. Louis, right, versus somebody that's in Seattle. They're different. Theoretically, they're yeah, different kinds of people. I mean, they're yeah. a thousand miles apart. They're, they're geographically not only different, but they're also going to be more diverse in, in in their their likes and dislikes. I mean, they're just different places. And so, and in your audience analysis, you've probably identified different pain points, mm-hmm. and so you should be able to highlight those specific pain points on your landing page, exactly specific to the area they're coming from. So another way to make it personal would be to make your landing page more interactive, right? Adding quizzes or assessments or, or calculators. Like mm-hmm. mortgage brokers do this all the time. We, we just we just met with a client here in uh, where we are, and they said that they wanted to put a calculator on there so people could calculate their mortgage. There's a million of them out there, but adding it to your landing page allows them to do it right there and not have to go off someplace else mm-hmm. to figure out how to m- figure out how much they needed to put down versus what their rate's going to be and what their monthly payments are going to be. So the visitor feels like they get some benefit and the bonus is that 
they're ultimately revealing really valuable information to you based yeah. on the answers that they provide Heck to this yeah. quiz or assessment or calculator. Now I know how much they make. I know, oh, good. I know, I know what their targets are. I know they down. I know how Every, how every time they adjust, the yeah, every time they put more different money in there and adjust, I can see what, what rate they're trying to get or what, what payments they're trying to get. I mean, that's tons of, tons of good information there. The other bonus is that visitors are buying at least indirectly into your offer, they'll stay interested in your offer up until they get the results. They're anticipating the results. And even after getting those results, they feel more emotionally invested in your brand. They're more likely to continue their relationship with you. Another bonus to personalized Ooh. landing pages is that they reduce your bounce rate. Mm -hmm. I know we've probably mentioned bounce rate before, but um, that makes a big positive impact on your SEO. It increases your engagement and leads to more conversions. Yeah. All right, we're, we're calling to this list. Let's talk about step number three, using long form pages with multiple calls to action. Mm -hmm. So this kind of goes against every basic landing page doctrine yes. you would probably imagine, which says that landing pages should be short and sweet. You don't want to make a landing page like a whole diatribe. And yet now we're telling you to use a long form page with multiple calls to action. Yeah, so there's there's a couple of studies that, that, that will tell you different things. And the reason why they all the studies that will tell you slightly different things is because it also depends on the platform, depends on the ad, and it depends on the landing page. There's a lot of variables here. And then it's the audience that you're targeting. And the product or service yeah. that you're trying to sell them. Yeah. So if you're if you're on Facebook and your ad has a total number of like 10 words, right? And then you send them to a, a short form page, you're literally saying to that person, you have to know who I am and you have to already trust me to purchase my product. And if it is, if it's your, if you're Coca-Cola and you're like, get a free six pack of Coke, click here. Well, yeah, okay. That's pretty easy. I know what Coke is. I know what, I, I know what to expect. But if you're selling like your information services about how awesome of a consultant you are and you, um, I'm the best consultant in your area slash demographic, click here. And then you click here. And then the page is like, I'm awesome. Click here to download my free trial. They're gonna be like, I'm. This is too much. I know nothing about yeah. this person. So, so yeah. If if you have a long form ad that's really long with a 10 minute video, and you're guaranteeing that person's gonna sit through that 10 minute video, maybe then you can go to a short form ad or a short form landing page. But in most cases, a long form isn't gonna kill you because uh, there was a study by um, conversion rate experts. And I love these guys, they're amazing. If you take a look at some of their case studies, they'll show these short form landing pages versus these long form landing pages. And when they say long, I mean like freaking yards long. <laughs> these things are huge. And the reason why is because they're saying to this landing page, there's multiple benefits that I wanna provide to my client. And while I think the number one benefit is A, B might be the conversion or C or D or E or F, plus I wanna add in all these other points. And we're gonna get to the other points like social proof and stuff in a few seconds. But all of that thing needs to be squeezed into this landing page and it's just not enough real estate if you're trying to push everything above the fold. It'll just look like a freaking mess, right? Yeah. So, you know, you kind of briefly mentioned a short form landing page can work great if you have a very straightforward offer that doesn't require a lot of explanation or um, really basis of building trust with your customer. If it's um, a low cost product or a no cost product that you're asking them to opt in that's got value to them that would, you know, be pretty easy to yeah. sell without a long form. Um, or if you're really already well established and trusted by the visitors to this landing page and they're going to know who you are and what you do and you're just basically looking to cut to the chase. Um, we talk about, and we talked in the beginning about reducing the um, likelihood that a person's going to get to that page and either get lost in the data and information or just get overwhelmed. And the point of a long form landing page is really to be more persuasive and establish trust with a customer that you're going to need to get more of a connection with because you have a more expensive product, yeah. you have a longer buying cycle, or, you know, they don't know you from Adam. Yeah. And so they're, you're, and you're asking them to provide what is to them valuable information, which is contact information. Yeah. Uh, if you need to be able to establish that you're trustworthy and that it's worth it mm -hmm. in order to get them to convert, a long page form can make sense. And, and a really good example of this, if you, if you again, you want to jump into somebody's sales funnel just to kind of see how it works, check, go to uh, Facebook, uh, search for a person named Frank Kern. Mm -hmm. And what it'll do is he's, a, he's, he's a, just a consultant. But as soon as you go on his Facebook page, boom, you're going to be in his retargeting list. Just look at a couple of his posts and then wait. 
oh, it's, <laughs> it's going to get good. In a couple of days, you'll get an ad on Facebook in your news feed for Frank Kern. When you see that ad, you'll see it's a pretty well-worded ad and whatever. It's trying to get you to like, hey, you want more clients for whatever business slash service you do? When you click it and go to the landing page, that landing page is long. I mean, it's super long. You could trail it behind you for days. <laughs> it's so long. Well, and we had originally actually included Frank Kern in this podcast, and then you just brought him up anyway, even though he's not in the notes, because um, the reason I removed him was because when we really looked at how Frank Kern does his model versus the way, for example, Copyblogger um, offers a copywriting course, and they use a long offer to do so. It gives a lot of details about the offer, but where they really do it better is mm -hmm. because they include multiple integrated calls to action, and that's one thing that Frank Kern really doesn't do. Yeah, he, he's he more like a long sales letter that just rambles on for yeah, quite a while. And yeah, and you really have to just be ready to sit down and start reading. Yeah. Whereas, for the most part, your customer, if, there's, if they're ready earlier on in the piece, you want to give them integrated calls to action that are relevant and timely. So you place them um, in certain places that are basically tied to um, each persuasive section. So each time you give some like reason that there's a benefit to them taking that action yeah. you want them to take, you want to list um, a call to action and allow them to take that action right then if they don't want to have to scroll all the way down to the bottom to find yeah. out how to get what you want. And, and usually a little bonus tip, I know this is in our show notes, but I'm going to throw it in there anyway. Uh, what you can do is add conversion points around your con your CTA. So a conversion point would be something like, you know, 10 other people took this offer today or only three left or uh, put social proof next to it, which mm -hmm. is throw a, a couple of reviews right next to the CTA. What that does is it kind of says, oh, this is what I need to do. Th look, other people are doing this. It's safe. I don't have to worry about, you know, jumping off a cliff and being the only one doing it. Yeah. So again, you're establishing trust with this long yes. form offer. Um, if you are utilizing multiple calls to action, a key here is that you need your CTAs to be consistent. So each CTA should ask visitors to take the same action. With a landing page, you have one goal. You can't have like seven different things that that person could do that you want them to do. You need to focus on one goal. Is it collecting their email address to send them uh, a an additional piece of content? Is it having them sign up for your webinar? Is it having yeah. them purchase a product or sign up for some sort of service? Be consistent with your offer and be consistent with your CTA. Yeah, that makes perfect sense. Step number four, mind your manners and say thanks. So this is, when I first started talking about this, I was thinking, wait a second, we're talking about converting on a landing page, so how does sending a customer or a visitor to a thank you page after they've converted really affect your conversion? And it took me a second to realize it's not just about getting that visitor to your landing page to convert on your offer, it's converting them to a customer. Yeah. And at this stage in the game, if you've gotten them to provide you with an email address, phone number, whatever it is that you're looking for them to do or take you up on your offer, that's the first step in your relationship with this customer. And it's important that you acknowledge what they just gave you because mm -hmm. there's value in that email address, offer, money that they just gave you. They did what you wanted them to do. So say thank you yeah. and give them information about what's going to happen next. Yeah. Um, it's a very important step for establishing your future relationship with who is now a customer, not just a lead. They're even more valuable and converting them is converting them to a valuable customer. And this isn't this isn't just something that's like just just for good manners because we're told to do it. This is actually backed by science. So uh, I used to have a, a behaviorist that came in and consulted with us for, for, I don't know, like two years, right? Yeah. And one of the things that he always said is reward appropriate behavior. And so if he asked you a question and you answered it, as soon as you answered, he'd give you a piece of candy. It, because he was constantly creating this system where every time you did what he asked you to do, he would give you something and you'd be rewarded. Oh, I don't even want candy, but awesome. Right? <laughs> and so if somebody does something, you instantly reward them with a thank you. But you can't just instantly reward them and thank you and then leave them alone. Like mm -hmm. you can't say, oh, thank you for doing that. And then there's this weirdness that happens. Instead, what you do, you give them instruction for what to do next. Or what? let them know what's going to happen next. Yeah, so yeah. thank you for signing up for our webinar Keep an eye on your email. We're going to send you an invitation uh, with a special link when the webinar goes live. Expect that on this yeah. date. See, I would change that slightly in the wording. It would be something more like, go check your email, blah, blah, blah. I would give them a little instruction because they just did what I wanted them to do. I'm rewarding them. Now I'm going to give them another instruction. And guess what I'm going to do in that email when they get it? 
I'm going to reward them again. Hey, thanks for opening my email. Let me tell you about this cool thing. And then I'm going to give them another instruction. Mm -hmm. Because as humans, we like to get rewarded for stuff that we do, right? And so when we do something that somebody asks us and we get rewarded, we're more likely to take the next action. And that creates what's called behavioral momentum. And the more behavioral momentum you've got going in the direction you want them to go, the more money you're going to make. It's just plain simple. And that's part of what you can do on a thank you page. Obviously, you want to say thank you. You want to inform customers what to expect next, provide additional information that you think a customer might find helpful. But it's also an opportunity for you to offer an upsell. Woohoo! Your favorite. Yes. Upsells, cross sells. Uh, Upsells, cross sells, down Anything sells. With the word sell in it. Is oh, your yeah. Or whatever. Uh, it's so good. Yeah. Basically, you want to make the most of an engaged customer that either is already starting on this behavioral momentum or even better, already maybe has their wallet open if they've already purchased yeah. something. We, we used to say on the, on, the, on the old shoe sale floor, we used to say, don't stop selling until their wallet closes, right? <laughs> so just keep going. And, and when they're, when, oh, I'm done. Okay. Then you're done. You don't have yeah. to keep pushing them. But until they literally get up from their seat and go, I'm done, guys. Guys, just keep going. Hey, how about this? How about this? How about this? What about this? What about this? Um, it's also an opportunity. Some people choose to use their thank you pages to ask that customer to take a specific action. So this would be, for example, share um, our service with your friends and family. So initially, when I thought about that, I was like, okay, those are annoying, and I always annoy. You know, I always avoid those. I think in certain circumstances, you can do that, and word worded properly it can work so yeah. you just got exclusive access to blah 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 offer invite your friends to get it too like make it sound like there's something that they're doing to benefit their friends and that they're being super nice and awesome by giving them access well and there's there's a thing on uh, a kind of a trend on facebook and also on twitter where if somebody likes a a, a particular post they'll actually just tag their friend's name in it mm -hmm. like we're running a sales uh post right now for for one of our companies and i'm getting all of these things with just people's names in it and yeah. I, I mean I mean, being the marketer that I am, I want to. I click their name and I send them a message. Hey, I saw James just sent you this message. Blah, blah blah. But I mean, that's just me being silly. But <laughs> um, adding that, share this with your friends and family, or or share this with your community, or things like that, also is really great. There's there's even sometimes you can run little contests where you know you can give away. Here, I just gave you my top five tips on how to shave a cat. Click here, and if you share this with with your your audience uh, on Twitter, I'll send you my bonus tip on how to keep that cat from killing you during the <laughs> during the during process. The process. You're like son of a gun. I'm going to share that right now, <laughs> right? <laughs> Some people also will utilize that um, with some sort of incentive to do so. So, you know, you just got 20% off and you'll get, you know, an additional $5 off your order if another, you know, if a friend of yours uses this code. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, there's multiple ways to do it, um, but it ultimately, you want to have your newly converted, engaged customer when they're most likely to talk about how much yeah. they like the experience or how excited they are about your product. That's the best time they're likely to share or like evangelize. Yes, evangelize yes. your product or service. And so you want to take advantage of that momentum. Yeah. All right. So, step number five establish legitimacy. Yes, being trustworthy and credible are critical to conversion. Yeah. If visitors aren't sure that you're a real business or they're kind of, they're, they're going to kind of take, uh, hesitate to take action on the things that you're trying to tell them you're going to do for them. No matter how compelling it is, if they yeah. don't really know that you're truly legit and that you're not just trying to like get their info so you can stick them on some spam list, they're probably not going to yeah. give up any info for you. So like we talked about earlier about conversion signals, one of the biggest conversion signals is social proof. Mm -hmm. So you can do user reviews. You can literally take uh, screenshots of your Yelp reviews and toss them onto your landing page. Cherry picked for the best ones. Yeah, well, of course. Uh, you don't have to go to Yelp because we got it all right here. See, yeah. look, we got great reviews. But if you've ever been on 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 an actual media, like you've been on ABC or CBS or some television show, you can uh, put a link to that or mm -hmm. show that you've done it because all of that, oh, well, if the local news trusts them, then obviously I should trust them too right. because the local news isn't a scam, I don't think, maybe. <laughs> no, definitely In not. In today's America, course. definitely not. We'll just say no. <laughs> Uh, another option would be to display your contact information or your physical address directly on your landing page. You know, I've seen a number of landing pages that make it so hard to really just yeah. find out where does this company exist? How would I call if I had a question that I couldn't answer from the confines of this page? Because it's going to happen. Yeah. 
Um, and how hard do you make it for them to reach you? And Don't make it hard. Make it as easy as possible. The number two trafficked web page on most websites is the about page because mm -hmm. they want to go, who am I dealing with? Where are they located? How many customers or how many employees do they have? Have they dealt with customers like me before? Or and how long have they been in business? Exactly. So mm -hmm. they want to know all that stuff. And so giving that, even if it's just at the footer, it at least goes, oh, okay, I see they're in St. Petersburg, Florida, and they've been around for 14 years now. Oh, okay, I get it. That's cool. And I can't tell you how many landing pages I've seen these days that the only contact information they offer you is some generic email address, info at. And you're like, okay, but really, I mean, what if I buy your product or service, then I have a problem with it. And you give me no ability to call you, no ability to reach out and talk to somebody yeah. um, if there's a problem after I commit to whatever it is that you've offered me. So another option there is to um, add live chat support. The, what I really love about the live chat support is that at this stage in the process, some visitors, they might just need more information in order to commit to your offer. Tell me about it. They don't necessarily want to have to call and talk to somebody on the phone because that's disruptive to their day and they're in the environment of being online. And so an instant chat gives them the ability to provide or get in this case. The instant chat gives them the ability to get immediate answers to these questions exactly at their point of hesitation when they might otherwise have backed out because they just didn't know one you know piece of information that's easy enough for you to offer. Um, and the other benefit is that human interaction resolves their query while also giving your staff the opportunity to highlight your brand's personality. So if you tend to be more... Um, goofy and silly or serious and knowledgeable. I mean, you can really translate yeah. that into your um, interactions on a chat platform. And, and if you don't have a tough ton of money to like invest in chat, like you, 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 Olark costs like a hundred bucks or $129 or, and there's different programs you can get. If you can't afford any of that, just go to add Facebook messenger onto mm -hmm. your page. That's a very easy way for people to inter interact with you. And the nice thing about Facebook messengers, they don't do a lot of these like, we have live chat on, on one of our websites and people would go in there and just play with us because nerds on call, it's funny and mm -hmm. so, or squirrel, like they just think it's funny. And so they, they tell us little jokes or, or, or whatever, or, or try to make us chat with them about something ridiculous. Yeah. Um, but if you use Facebook, they can't be anonymous. And so by using Facebook Messenger, you're not going to get a lot of these like, ha ha ha, I'm making a joke on you and I'm trolling you about Wasting something silly. Your yeah. yeah, your client's time. Yeah. Um, and also, I'm sure we'll talk in a future episode about some of the other benefits of using Facebook marketing uh, or Facebook messaging uh, in terms of from a digital marketing perspective, too. I've, I've heard a number of different uh, benefits there as people grow more and more comfortable with Facebook messaging platform. Yes. So in many cases, your landing page is going to be your one chance to convert an ad click into a customer. Your landing page needs to be a conversion machine, engaging and convincing visitors to stay and act. So final tip, tip which Ryan mentioned already, is remember to A-B test each approach we've mentioned here today to see what works for your brand and your customer. Um, so don't just like run out and implement all these all at once mm -hmm. and strip out something that you don't use as a basis. Keep what you've got working now and try this other version and send some traffic to it and see what traffic converts better on your call to action. Yeah, excellent. Well, that's it for today. For links to the resources we talked about today, go to squirreldigitalmarketing.com slash podcast to check out the show notes. And if you're learning new ways to grow your business and improve your outreach, be sure to rate us on whatever platform you're listening to us on today. Better yet, leave us a review. I'm Ryan Eldridge. And I'm Andrea Eldridge. Thanks for tuning in to Growth Marketer Academy. Boom, chicka -choo. This has been Growth Marketer Academy with Ryan and Andrea Eldridge. Boom,